Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, come in with lots of space over there. Um, just don't be shy. Come in, come in. Um, hi, I'm Philip. I'm from Elastic, the company doing Elasticsearch and lots of other products. But we won't mainly speak about that. Um, since I'm in infrastructure, we will just talk about deployments. Um, and as you can see, I'm infrastructure, and then this is a Unix pipe, actually. I'm piping that into developer advocacy, so I'm at lots of conferences and doing talks. And when I'm not out doing talks in other cities, I'm also running meetups back in Vienna. Uh, one about databases, one about more the theoretical side uh, papers. So, yes, this will be themed on the original movie 7. Um, I hope everybody knows it. Um, it helps. Um, yep, come in, come in. We have loads of space over here. Um, yeah, it shouldn't be taken all that seriously. Um, I will make some fun about stuff, uh, but it's just more of the th thought-provoking side. Um, any confessions before we start? Anybody? Yeah, we will get to the confessions later on, I guess. So, let's jump right into it. Um, which sin is that? Gluttony, Gluttony right. Um, the overconsumption or overindulgence uh, to the point of waste which could be, for example, add all the dependencies, like all of them. Um, my main assumption here, for example, is Java. Like, if you've ever used Java, it is not the lightest thing. Like, it needs to take up a lot of memory. And if you have all these little or small or big dependencies, uh, you will use up a lot of permgen space or metaspace in JDK 8. And it will, yeah, take memory, and it will also make your deployments pretty fat. And you will need more disk and space. And it is not so nice. So for example, if you're using AWS, which probably many people do, uh, they at some point realized they had one very big dependency, which was just their SDK. It's their entire thing. It was nearly 13 megabytes. And just to uh, use one single piece uh, of AWS infrastructure from your Java code, you needed that 13 megabyte file. And at some point, they said, uh, well, it's probably not sustainable. Just because you use one component like Amazon S3, uh, I need this 13 megabyte thing. And every time I deploy something, I have 13 megabytes of dependencies I need to carry with me. So that is not really that great. So they put it on a diet. Uh, they slimmed it down in version 110. And from now on, it's much lighter. Like You just define whatever version you're using, and then you just pull in one little dependency, and it uses way less space. So this is good. Um, can you overdo this? Yes. Um, here I'm more thinking about the Node and PM world. Um, you know, uh, Bill Gates once famously said 640k ought to be enough for everybody. And from what I've heard in the NPM world, this is like, can I build my project just with 640k dependencies? Or do I need more dependencies than that? Um, yeah can go pretty wrong, like people remembering left pad. Yeah. Um, there are some more seats over here if you want to come over and sit. Otherwise, yeah, stay where you are. Yeah, the other thing you could do is combine all the projects. Like, we know monoliths are bad, like nobody wants to do them. And you can easily containerize stuff now. But containerizing is not as easy as it might seem. Um, might look like something like this. You have all your little independent containers. Um, they're doing great. Just orchestration is maybe not that fun anymore. Um, yeah, but your boss told you to do so, and now you have all these little containers. And at the moment, we have like the, the gluttony thing is, is, at least for the deployment side, it's not so much on Vogue. Uh, now it's, everything is a microservice. Uh, but why stop at microservice? Like, we could go further. Like, we could have nanoservices. Pico, Femto, Yok uh, Atto, Yocto. Yocto is the smallest thing I could find. Uh, but so once you have found Yocto services, uh, you've probably reached uh, Yocto microservice or whatever. And this sounds great in theory, uh, but it doesn't look that nice in practice sometimes. Like if you would compare it to models, like if you draw the left hand side, that looks kind of okay. If somebody really looked like that, it's probably less appealing. And I often feel the same for microservices, where in theory, this looks like super slim and nice, but practice is, well, probably not that nice. And yeah, Gartner once published this. I think this is the only good thing Gartner ever did, or the only thing that is really true and held up. Um, it's their 
peak of inflated expectations and you have your threat of illusion and at some point you reach the plateau of productivity. So with microservices, I'm not sure where we are at the moment. Like some people are probably at the productivity level already. Others are just climbing up to the peak. Others have fallen down to the trout already. Um, that will always depend. So I'm not bashing microservices. Um, they do help. If you have too many people or too many dependencies or you need to scale up bits and pieces independently, microservices are great. Um, will they solve all your problems? Unfortunately not. Um, doesn't work that easily. Why? Um, distributed systems are hard. Like, I guess everybody knows those. Eight fallacies of distributed computing, originally from good old Sun. Um, if you're more on the up-and-coming technology side, uh, somebody who was at Twitter, Jeff Hodges, wrote something very similar, notes on distributed systems for young bloods, all the things he learned at Twitter. Like, you probably remember the fail whale, and you used to see it a lot. But you don't see it really much anymore because they have learned, they, I mean, they had a, had a hard time, but now they have improved a lot. And what his takeaway mainly is, is distributed systems are not hard because of latency, uh, but it is really about stuff fails, and stuff fails, like little bits and pieces fail. Um, so this gets hard, um, and then people often come and say, like, is this SOA done right now? Like, who remembers good old SOA? Who has ever done SOA? Okay, most of you are too young. Nice. I, I mean, just don't suffer it. Um, there was a reason why uh, SOA was actually called WS Death Star, because you had all these standards, and you had a standard for everything, and it would probably fail miserably. And yeah, people at some point discovered that this is not so nice. And microservices are kind of a saner approach now, and everything is REST, and that, that is way nicer. But again, stuff is often not, still not as easy as it could be. For example, Who's using uh, Wireshark? Lots of you. Wireshark is nice as long as you have everything on one box, because then you can just see the packets and see what is going on. If you have a highly distributed system and you need to run Wireshark on 10 different servers, um, it's not as nice. Um, and there's this nice quote. Uh, with microservices, it's more like a murder mystery, because you have all these bits and pieces you need to book together. And this is pretty much the Wireshark story, where you need to collect all these bits and pieces, and at some point, maybe you find the, the reason why bad stuff is happening. Or you don't find it, so yeah, whatever. Any guesses what that is? We're still talking about microservices. Yes, exactly. That is. Shared database uh, and their two microservices. And the two uh, fighter jets, they are pretty useless on their own. So if the Death Star is gone, the fighter jets don't have much of a job anymore. So if you have one huge uh, shared database for all your microservices, you're probably not using the full potential and it's probably not as independent as it could be. So this is a nice quote. Don't even consider microservices uh, unless you have a system that's too complex to manage as a monolith. Yeah, the majority of projects should not be started like that. Um, but still pay good attention to modularity. And that is Martin Fahler, and he also write, wrote a very nice blog post about it and described the different architectures. Like, on the left-hand side, you can see 2005, stuff was pretty simple. You could grasp that or keep that in your head pretty easily. Right-hand side is just a little more complex. Um, yeah, but you can throw in all the technologies you ever wanted to use. So, um, yeah, stuff is not just getting easier. And probably the main reason why people love um, the microservice approach is because it has such a fancy name. Uh, and maybe we just should just find a nicer name for uh, the f uh, fat old monolith. So if we called it Mega Platform, Uber Container, or Stereolith, it would be much cooler, right? Or I'm actually proposing a hashtag. I would call it serverful. <laughs> we have different trend there as well. Um, we, we'll come back to that again. Um, so small, simple microservices are super nice on their own, but the complexity does not vanish. You're just pushing the complexity to a different layer, which is the integration layer, which might solve your problem. Um, but this problem does not go away in entirety. It's just a different kind of pain point you will have. Yeah. And Sam Newman, he's also very big in the microservices world, so he is actually very much a proponent. But even he says, like, um, 
for big teams and a large number of people, that is totally working. For smaller teams, probably not, or you just need to weigh, like, if this is worth it. Uh, and everybody repeat with me, I'm not Facebook, Google, or Amazon. Like, just because they're doing it doesn't mean you should do it. Okay, next sin. That's easy, it's already written there, greed. Um, yeah, I guess everybody knows what greed is. I just have a single slide for that. Uh, we kind of move past that a bit. Um, maybe somebody still remembers that. Good old Chabos by Red Hat. Yeah, I, I used it like five or more years ago, and I think it took like five minutes to start up. And every redeploy took 90 seconds, and after five redeploys, it would crash with an out-of-memory exception. And that was kind of, yeah, my experience of greed. Like, if you need all the resources, this is probably not what you want to do. Okay, coming up next, what is that? If you can see it, which sin? Yeah, sloth, exactly. Uh, the laziness, which is both physical and spiritual. Um, and I'm thinking about here more of the continuous whatever. So I guess you're all familiar, continuous integration, um, build everything you push. I hope everybody is doing that. I'm a strong believer that you should do this. Continuous delivery, uh, you push out everything to development, but production is still a manual process. This is probably also helping you to iterate quickly. And then there is continuous deployment, uh, where you actually push out to production. Many people do it. It's useful for many use cases, but I'm not convinced it's really needed for everything. And just to throw a few more buzzwords around, um, yeah, you have Agile, so we've moved Agile, I mentioned Agile as well, and that's kind of the base for everything. And then you go to continuous integration, once you've mastered that delivery, at some point probably deployment, and yeah, just to mention DevOps as well, um, if you do all of that, then you've mainly re maybe reached uh, DevOps or not. But is it really necessary? I don't know, I'm still not convinced. Um, like, what tools can you use to do that? Um, I'm using Jenkins a lot. Um, who's using Jenkins? Just to, yeah, okay. Do you like it? Yeah? Okay. Sometimes I like it, sometimes I don't like it. Um, I found this description which I find very, um, yeah, that's very true. You have the Jerkins, which is failing on purpose. You have the Junkins, which is just junk because you're failing of out of incompetence, and then in Jenkins, uh, there is no real reason for that, whatever. Um, so this can happen. Um, my team in infrastructure at Elastic, we have, I don't know, 40, 50, whatever Jenkins servers, and we are fighting them kind of a daily basis, and it's kind of a love-hate relationship, but it works. Um, other stuff where you should not be lazy, and what you should do is uh, separate code and configuration, so, for example, do not bake in whatever, where, where your database lives or your credentials or something into the artifacts you have. Because once you need to change something, because, I don't know, a password got compromised or something like that, or you want to add more servers and you need to change your configuration, you do not want to re-spin uh, all your artifacts you have built. Especially if you're coming from the Java world or something where you have, like, artifacts, it's not just a git pull, but you build an artifact, you do not want to re-spin that artifact just because of a configuration change. That's not so nice. Um, and please, don't commit your secrets. Um, use something else uh, like HashiCorp Vault, Ansible Vault. There are lots of options, uh, but don't bake in your secrets. Uh, if every, anybody ever gets access to your source code, you will be in a world of pain. Like, many people have this, or this happened, few times where somebody created an internal tool, they just pushed their credentials. At some point later on, they had forgotten that the credentials were in there, and they decided, well, this is actually quite nice. I will open source that so everybody can use that. And then three days later, they wake up and their, all their servers had been terminated. Like, there were companies who had that happen to them because somebody found their AWS credentials uh, in their source code, they had forgotten about it, and somebody started either mining bitcoins or a competitor just terminated everything they had, and it killed a few companies. So don't do that. Next up, which sin is that? Yeah, it's a bit hard to see. Um, lust. The intense and uncontrollable desire. I'm always describing it like, always use the hottest shit. Like, who doesn't want to do that? Um, and one example we could use here um, is Docker. I know everybody loves Docker. I, <laughs> I also like the bashing Docker, but this is nice. Um, sorry? 
Ah, sorry, it's mainstream now. <laughs> that is very disappointing. Um, yeah. Can you continue with the yeah, 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 yeah. Let's see wha where, where we can go. Um, why Docker? Everybody knows that, but it works on my machine. Um, I used to have this colleague who would always say, but it works on my machine. And at some point, you just had to tell him, well, back up your email, your laptop is going to production now, because obviously nowhere else it's working. <laughs> so that's the only solution we have now. And Docker is kind of the idea why you don't want to do that. Like, OK, it works on your machine. Um, so Docker there, um, just push the same thing out, and hopefully it still works. Um, but yeah, we've seen that. This is like another illustration, like you have your nice little containers. They work independently, but this is not really so solving anything. Like, that is not the solution. Um, like, yeah, you've containerized the fish. Good luck. Um, or another way to look at this is everything is tires. Like, it's super simple because you have tires everywhere. Um, and you can understand the whole system just because of tires. That all the tires are burning is kind of side effect. Like, that can happen. Um, but yeah, and containers will not fix your broken architecture. You are welcome. Um, or another way I like to look at it is like you have a big container ship, and all the containers on their own are doing pretty well, right? It's just the entire thing is not doing that well. Like this is also what containers can give you. Um, or there was this security vulnerability at some point in glibc. Um, and then you would have needed to uh, re-image all your Docker containers just to have glibc. I know there's Alpine, there's no glibc. Um, that creates its own problems then. We've done that at Elastic, and we're still not sure if uh, Alpine is really the solution. Uh, but yeah, containers are not solving all your problems. And I don't know, anybody use, knows that one? <laughs> Hitler uses Docker. I, I'm not showing you the video now, but this is really hilarious. Like, all the usual stuff you would expect is um, <laughs> that is where, where he throws out everybody. Um, and then, yeah, people running Docker on GCE in VM instances that run on Linux containers on Borg. So it's kind of turtles all the way down. It's a like container and container and container. Uh, it's a great movie. It's just five minutes of your time. Uh, I can highly recommend it. Any ideas what that is? Legacy application. <laughs> but for that, it might even work. Like, if you have still your old COBOL application and you don't have no idea how to run it anywhere else, just put it in a container and just keep it in a, in a corner and try not to have any issues with that. Um, yeah, and then, like, great combination, microservices and containers, like the cargo felt. Um, Dilbert always says it best, like, um, we're just doing what the big successful companies are doing, and profits here we come. Like, it's probably not that simple. Um, yeah, and then there is, Kyle is pretty well known. He destroys distributed systems on a professional level by now. Uh, and whenever he has a problem, people will reply, Docker. It's like, I don't care about your problem. The solution is Docker. Like, use a container. And yeah, he put that out once and just mute everybody who is saying that. And even uh, Kelsey, I think he is a developer advocate from Google. Uh, even he says, like, if you're picking Kubernetes just because Google does it, uh, Maybe you should write your own file system, because Google does that as well. Um, who writes their own file system? Yeah, good. <laughs> um, or if you're in the Java world, uh, do you even need containers? Like, Josh Long uh, always says, make jar, not war, uh, because the spring side is like, they don't like application servers. They have just one fat jar where they keep everything. But for me, that is also very much like the container approach, or it solves the container need, really. Because you don't have any external dependencies. Um, you have the JDK, probably on an AWS instance, and your jar file, and that contains everything, and you don't have any other dependencies. Maybe you don't need containers anymore. Ah, and one more thing, yeah, serverless. Like, everybody loves serverless, right? Um, because now we're doing serverless architecture. Next year, we're doing. <laughs> Uh, Codeless, and then we're architectureless. <laughs> and we are probably not needed anymore at some point anymore, right? And then everybody's asking, like, is this platform as a service reborn? Because, like, we had platform as a service, and I think eight or nine years ago at university, I was kind of told, like, well, infrastructure as a service, this is the base step. But 
from now on, everything will platform as a, be platform as a service. Nobody will run their own service anymore. Nobody does that. Uh, it didn't work the first time. Now we're trying again. And yeah, serverless is actually cool uh, for many use cases. Uh, and you can even call it pass reborn in case your pass can start very quickly and just run, run half a second. But serverless for many use cases is really useful. So I don't want to bash that too much. Next up. Yeah, OK, that's easy. Pride. You can probably see that. Um, believing uh, you are better than others. Like, I don't need to monitor my stuff because it just works. Um, don't do that. Like, I've used New Relic in the past. It's working kind of fine. If you're running it on AWS, uh, the mid tier is actually free. You just need to tell them, like, hey, we're running on AWS. Um, and you can run that for free. Um, another company I really like is Datadog. Like, they also have monitoring, and they can tie into lots of different systems. They have also kind of a sane pricing model. I think it's just 15 euro or something like that per server per month. Uh, and they provide a very nice overview. So uh, Datadog is really nice. Which sin is that? Or what is that? And the answer is not Kevin Spacey. <laughs> Envy. This content towards someone's traits, status, abilities, or rewards. Um, this is like the craft everything yourself. Like the not invented here syndrome. Many probably are guilty of that. Like sometimes I am, sometimes I see it in colleagues, and I really dislike it where you have to rewrite everything yourself. Like I have or had some colleagues that want to rewrite everything in Haskell. So there's a perfectly fine tool, and they say, well, we're functional programmers. We write, we write everything in Haskell. It can be a good idea, but sometimes it's not a good idea. It kind of depends. Um, if you're coming from the Java side again, there it used to be the real problem where you had the, the Java guru who would create the initial product, project, and he would like lock himself into a room for a week and then have like all the different dependencies put together, uh, and just that specific version of everything would work together. That's not really needed anymore. Um, if you're on the Spring side of stuff, that's the easiest way to get started. I don't know. Is anybody using Spring Boot? Um, if you're using Java, you should. Um, it's really nice. OK, uh, you can tell I'm not much of a JEE fan. Um, but what it gives you is you have a web interface. Um, you just provide a few details, like you need to fill in two fields, say which versions you want to have, and then just say, I want these dependencies. And you can just put in, like, I need web, I need security, and just same components. And it will package together something for you that has versions that you know will work together, and you have a lot of defaults, like logging is set up correctly for you, and it has just lots of same defaults, and you just need little guides to get started with that, so that makes your life way easier. On the hardware side, don't craft everything yourself. Um, who is familiar with pets versus kettle? OK, that is not too many. Quick explanation, pets versus kettle. Like, I can remember when I got my first virtual server, I think 10 years ago or so, it was my pet. When I got it, I gave it a name. And then I raised it by hand, and I installed everything, and it was like a handcrafting process, and it was my thing. And whenever something broke, I would care for it, and I would just like try to fix up stuff. But this is not really done how you, or is, this is not really how you do it anymore, like in the cloud or in bigger infrastructures. There you have cattle. Cattle don't have a name. They are just raised automatically, and if they get sick, you shoot them. So they don't in <laughs> infest the, the rest of your stock. And this is exactly what you should do with your service. Like, if something starts misbehaving, you kill it. And then you recreate something new. And ideally, everything is automated, so it's very easy to do. Um, so I've used Ansible a lot in the past. Um, you can use it to configure AWS. You can provision your instances. You can deploy. But you don't have to use Ansible. Like, this is just one option. Like, you can use uh, Terraform from HashiCorp, Puppet, Chef, whatever your poison is. Just do something so this is automated. And you do not, like, handcrafting, enter some SSH commands, and try to create the same server again, because you will sleep better once you have automated this. Because this was, once before I had it, this was one of the biggest fears. Like, one of the production systems dies, 
And even though you have kind of documented how it worked, you will never be able to create that same snowflake again. Like this was one co unique combination, and you will never be able to get exactly that combination again. Um, so yes, automate all the things. Brad Pitt, um, which sin is that? Wrath, uh, known as rage. Um, so if stuff goes wrong, don't just rage, but have a constructive approach how to do it and how to work on that. The first thing is logging. Log all your things somewhere, and especially if you have a distributed system, uh, the answer is not SSH plus tail. Like, yes, you can do that, but it's getting pretty painful at some point if you have 10 open SSH windows and then just try to piece the different things together. Again, it's like more like a murder mystery than something productive you want to use. And there are many solutions. Uh, one is provided by us. Like, who is using the Elastic Stack, good old Elk Stack, what it was called? Good. It's always nice to hear. Um, yeah. We have four open source com uh, components which you can use. Beats is like a lightweight agent. You can collect files, network packets, system metrics, all the things. Uh, we will have something soon that can ping your applications. You can store that in Elasticsearch and visualize everything in Kibana. So that is very nice to get started, especially in that uh, space. And if you're looking more for how to get there, uh, we call it the Elastic Journey. Um, if you want to get started, there are the open source products, uh, which many of you are using. If you're especially more in the enterprise world, uh, we are here to help you. Like We provide training, dev support, consulting, uh, production support. And what you, in the end, will hopefully have is you have a nice Kibana dashboard, which you can put on a big TV screen somewhere in your office, and you can see all the things that are going on, like how much traffic do I have, how many unique IPs are hitting my servers, uh, how are the bytes over time, where are my, my visitors coming from, which are the top cities uh, with visitors and all these things. And you can also create that for your business metrics and see like how much stuff have I sold or what are my transactions, whatever. And this is the logging side, uh, but you might also want to collect stuff that goes wrong. So again, refs, like uh, stack traces or something. And one product I really like is Sentry. Is anybody using Sentry heard of that? Yeah, that is a very nice tool. Um, so it is really there for stack traces and stuff gone wrong. And it knows this is the same error you've had before, the same stack trace. And it will aggregate that for you. And it will tell you over the last 10 days, you've had this stack trace 100 times. And 20 users were affected. And yeah, you can assign that to somebody, and then it even knows like how versioning works, and this has been resolved, or this is still open. And this is also one of the saner approaches to keep track of all the stuff going wrong, and not just drowning in error messages. So this is really one of the nicer tools. So to conclude, we've had our seven sins. Um, gluttony was about the size or number of dependencies. Um, greed uh, was, yeah. We have this one big thing or one very old version of something. Sloth, um, the continuous integration, deployment, delivery, or delivery deployment, whatever you want to do. Like, just have a plan. You don't need to actually deploy automatically, but you should have a reason like why you're not doing it or why it's worth it or not worth it. Um, envy uh, was don't do everything yourself. Not invented here syndrome is a real problem. Um, especially if you want to get new people on the project, and if everything has been built in-house, nobody knows how to get started. And also, it's very difficult to take knowledge elsewhere or get help from somewhere else. Um, wrath, log and collect all the things, ideally centrally, to have a general overview and know what is going on. Um, pride, monitor your stuff. You're not better than others. Stuff will go wrong. You will make errors. Um, keep monitoring. And last was, don't always use the hottest shit. And if you're not that familiar with the movie 7 anymore, there is, I think it's one or two minutes, uh, a 7-bit version. Oh, sorry, 8-bit. Uh, like the 8-bit version of the movie, uh, where it's just like the good old computer games, where they're walking through the, the film and just giving you the gist of it in, yeah. <laughs>